someone kind of is asking a question. It's more than a com like a comment, but it, it implies a question, uh, saying that the elongated human brain, you're calling it human, I'm not sure it's human, but a brain would uh, indicate some kind of possible benefit. I, I guess what they're kind of pointing at was that's, I'm assuming that's a larger brain. It perhaps has... Um, you know, have you gone into the thing where, you know, it has a larger frontal lobe or it has a larger, you know what I'm saying, um, that gives the being who has such a brain, like, different powers than the ones like us that are shaped a certain way? Yeah, well, it's a good question. We found some of the skulls had 25% greater uh, cranial capacity than a uh, normal human being, ancient person who lived in the area. Also, the shape of the skull means that the contact between the left and right hemispheres would be different from us. Um, and also, the classic elongated skulls of Paractus, which which I believe are natural. I think, I think the oldest ones were born that way. They have this protrusion on the forehead, and that is related to the motor center and, and possibly higher psychic uh, capability. Um, so that's why I just continue to study these ancient people because I can't get answers out of archaeologists. Absolutely. It's, um, it's just endlessly fascinating, really, to go down this line of inquiry. Uh, just in terms of meditating do you do you actually uh, when you go to these various sites do you sit and meditate uh, to, to kind of get in tune with them well I'm actually I've, I was born very psychic so I, I don't I honestly don't think I have to get into a meditative state it, it just automatically happens okay. um, when I go to I mean I think that was probably the, the initial attraction. Um, from childhood, it, just looking at them in pictures, and you, you know there's something that doesn't fit in terms of what we're being told about history, and then being able to interact with the sites themselves. Um, you pick, yeah, you definitely pick up certain things, not necessarily at the time, but afterwards, and your energy level definitely alters. Um, I get very um, energetically uplifted when I'm at these places and it, it takes a while afterwards for me to wind back down. It's like suddenly having 10 cups of coffee because these places, um, you, you do naturally um, interact with them and I think that was their original function anyway, was um, places of very, you know, very powerful mind-altering energy. Yeah, I, I would agree with you completely there. Uh... And, and I, I do like to tell people about going to ancient sites that this is a place where you can actually jumpstart uh, your even, you know, DNA, uh, changing your DNA, doing all kinds of things. Uh, some of this stuff would happen absolutely naturally just by going, just by going to an ancient site uh, to where these amazing vortexes and, and so on are, are stargates, etc. Um, I know it happens to me when I go to these places, and I'm sure it happens to other people. Um, and yeah, there is a high um, associated with these places as well. Um, most of the time, it's, it's, it's very positive energy, actually very uplifting, I find. Do, yeah, have, me too. Have you, occurred, you know, sort of come across that? Uh, have you maybe pinpointed any particular sites where that didn't happen or where you got the opposite? Uh, feeling? Well, the, yeah, energetically speaking, the megalithic places are, um, I find very energizing. Um, and then when I go to places that are, you know, to some, de to some degree, the, some of the places we know are, are dynastic constructions in Egypt or are Inca constructions in and around Cusco, there's they're, they're, they kind of feel uh, dead, like they're not, they don't have the same force um, that the, the older places do. And I think that's, there are a number of reasons. Number one, the construction technique of the later uh, people was not as good. Uh, the intent was completely different. Um, so, yeah, and we, we also, I mean, 
I could do tours constantly if I wanted, I guess, but I can't do that. I have to pay these places so much respect that um, I like to be uh, away from them, you know, for at least a month. Like, I, I will not go to Machu Picchu every month. I have to leave it alone for at least a month or two before going back because I have to go with a degree of humility and with a, a need to learn learn something. If I keep blurting out the same story, then it becomes very dull for me and it's disrespectful of the site and the ancient ones, I think, whose energy is still there. Yeah, I, I think that's true. Um, very. In uh, by the way, I just wondered if you had ever heard of Patricia Corey, I think her name is. Are you familiar with her? She's a she seems to be a, an investigator of uh, certainly of Egypt sites in Egypt. I've heard the name, but I, I can't really f figure out where I've he uh, heard it from. Okay, because she had a very interesting experience that I related to in in at Ab Abydos in the in the temples there, and she tapped into seeing beings actually um, walking the the temple you know halls and so on. Um, and apparently that is something that goes on and there were other local people who have stumbled, been, in, been locked in the, accidentally locked in there at night um, and, and had all kinds of really bizarre experiences. Uh, so have you had any uh, bizarre experiences either in Egypt or any of the other ancient sites uh, like um, psychic uh, perceptions or things that happen to you on a more personal level? Well, yeah, there are certain places. There's there's one uh, <clears throat> there's one cave which is quite high up, and when, uh, in the Sacred Valley, uh, in between Cusco and Machu Picchu, and it has um, what you could call a portal. It's a it's an indentation in the stone about the size of a refrigerator. That, I don't know how they did that, but um, you know, it's human size. You can fit in. Um, the sonic interaction with it is very, very different. Uh, you know, inside the space as compared to outside. Uh, whenever I go there, I, I only take people there who I know are going to very much appreciate it. Um, because you know, we've had a number of tours where we've driven right past it, just because I didn't. I honestly didn't feel that people deserve to see it. And I, I always get this sense of welcoming when I go, and almost like invisible hands you know, trying to stop me from leaving when I go because it, it, it's a very lonely feeling place. I know in, the, in ancient times it was a very powerful place of, of learning and healing and, and probably uh, sound and thought transmission and it, it appreciates it when somebody goes who really wants to love it and learn from it. So that, that's one place, but many other places um, I feel that way too. Yeah, that's fascinating. Uh, well, it almost sounds a bit like a, possibly a door. Uh, there yeah. are ways I hear, uh, you know, in in these various places. Actual, you know, basically it's like a stargate, but it, you know, there is a you, the way you described it sounded a lot like a door, uh, possibly into other dimensions. Yeah, there's another more famous one called Marumuru which is near the shore of Lake Titicaca and it, um, again, Hugh Newman and, and I think we had six dowsers with us that day. The energy lines going in and out of that, they, they definitely could feel and register. Um, so it was definitely a, a place of, um, of ancient interaction with, ener with energies and uh, it still functions today if you're able to, to tune into it properly. Cool. Uh, okay, let's see. I don't, I don't know if this it relates to anything for you, but someone is asking why does 18.6 measure rules across the ocean? Not sure what they're saying there. Oh, I think they might be describing there's a band, uh, an energetic band that goes around the ocean or around the world. And many famous um, ancient sites are on it. Uh, there's a video, I can't remember the name of the video, but there's a video that depicts it quite well. And this this energy line goes from Easter Island to Paracas to Machu Picchu 
to Giza, to Mohenjo-Daro, and many other famous ancient sites are along this uh, narrow band of, of, uh, of energy that goes well, right around like, the surface. Sorry? It sounds, it sounds a little like the Richard Hoagland 19.5. I think it is the 19.5. Okay, so they're saying 18.6. I'm not sure. Maybe there's some discrepancy in the measurement, but I know that Hoagland talked about that being the case in other planets, um, that there's uh, not only the face on Mars, obviously, but uh, uh, there was uh, something showing up. I think it was on Jupiter, um, you know, in a, in a certain place uh, where it was a concentrated energy uh, happening at the, again at the 19.5. In other words, that this might be a, a general planetary thing. Mm -hmm. um, so, so let me see if there's any other questions cropping up here that I can um, grab. Do you think there's a serious connection between South American and world pyramids and megaliths? Uh, serious as in being serious or as in serious the star system? That's a good point. Uh, <laughs> maybe they did mean serious and they didn't know how to spell it. They used the word serious as, you know, as, as being serious in tone. But um, go ahead. Do you want to answer either way? <laughs> or, or both. Um, uh, I th I'm not sure if the, if the ancient builders in Peru and Egypt were the same the same. They may have been different, but they have the same uh, astonishing level of, of capability of working and manipulating stone, maybe in the same time frame too. We don't really know. All, all we know is that this, at this point is that this stuff is very, very ancient. Um, and in terms of Sirius, the star system, uh, yeah, there are definitely um, connections between Sirius and, uh, and ancient Egypt as well as in, in Peru and Bolivia. There are a lot of oral traditions that incorporate uh, both Sirius, the star system, and also the Pleiades. Um, so, both. Right. Uh, okay. In, in terms of your studies and your areas of study, are you doing any more? Um, I know you did some testing on, on the skulls. Are you pursuing that, like to get, uh, you know, I guess um, DNA and, and also age of the skulls and so on? Yeah, very much so. Um, at this point, we're in negotiations with finding the best um, ancient DNA lab in the world to work with because what people don't understand is ancient DNA testing is nothing like having your DNA tested. Um, the, the analogy I give is that when your DNA is tested, they take a blood or you know or a sample from inside your mouth and and then the chain you know the DNA chain is like a perfect cord because you're a living being but uh, studying ancient DNA and this is what Lloyd Pye found out and what was so difficult for him uh, was that uh, ancient DNA is like taking that perfect cord and putting it into a blender and turning the blender on for a while because the DNA breaks down very fast when someone dies and after 2,000 years it's very difficult to be able to get a, a strand long enough to study, so it's only the latest uh, equipment that's able to actually reassemble the DNA information. So we have the funding for that. We have a, a major Peruvian archaeologist who is working with us. It will actually be his study on behalf of the Peruvian people, um, and we have other laboratories in the U.S. and Europe that will be working with us, and we're in final negotiations with uh, the Peruvian authorities to be able to have this take place. So we're getting very close to it now. It's taken four years, but we're, we're almost there. Wow, that, that's fascinating uh, and wonderful to hear. Uh, so how will you be publicizing this once you get the information? You know, uh, are you, you know, do you have any plans along those lines? Well, yeah. I, I mean, the, the standard thing is is that uh, people would say, well, if you do a scientific study like this, it has to go in front of a peer group that have to be able to read it and look at it and analyze it and then say yes or no, it's worthy. We're, we're going to blast it on the internet as soon as we get it. It belongs to, all of this information belongs to every of the seven billion humans that live on this planet. 
So as soon as we learn something, it's on the internet so that anybody can can have it. Wonderful. Glad to hear it. Uh, let me see. Do you have any thoughts on the thousands of dolmen uh, built all over the world? Um, I'm, I'm not as fascinated by them as other researchers like Hugh Newman is definitely of, of dolmens. I find dolmens uh, fascinating, but I'm, I'm much more interested in examples of, of uh, ancient high technology. Uh, you know, there's some beautiful dolmen structures in England that I've been to and, and other places, and they look like they would, would have been very difficult to make, especially the giant stone put on top of other ones. Um, I, I'm much more, I'm interested in the future and getting more into the dowsing and energetic aspects of these places, so that will probably draw me into studying dolmens much more. Okay, well, would you have a clear definition of dolmen? Uh, because I think it's a little sketchy as to what, you know, what distinguishes a dolmen per se. Uh, do you have any thoughts on that? Uh, Hugh would, would be a much better person to, um, or, or Andrew, or sorry, James Swagger would be another one to talk to. Okay, um, yeah. fair enough. Uh, what about, um, what about places like Stonehenge? Have you, have you investigated Stonehenge and have you heard about a lot of the underground, um, sort of the new, supposed new discoveries that the English are making over there? Yeah, I first I first went to Stonehenge when I was 16, and uh, I've been there three times. Um, actually, I was on a radio show earlier today with Maria Wheatley, who's an expert on Stonehenge. Uh, she's just written a book about her latest discoveries of finding elongated skulls at Stonehenge. Oh, excellent. I'll have to get in touch with her. I, I have interviewed her in the past. I'd love to get back in touch. I'll do that. Uh, thank you for letting me know about that. Yeah, because what they what she's finding out is that there was a very ancient culture of, of people with the elongated skulls that lived there, and they were buried in the so-called long barrows, um, you know, which are funerary, funerary constructions, whereas normal-looking people were buried in round barrows. So the shape of the of the mound relates to what the person or people look like. Okay, that's really interesting. Uh, are you familiar with the you know the mounds in in the United States? And I haven't. Yeah, I haven't been to them yet, but um, I'm in contact with uh, researchers such as L.A. Marzulli, who is um, actively studying the ancient uh, giants of the Americas. Um, he's in the process of, of uh, working on an excavation somewhere in that area. I'd, I'd love to see Serpent Mound and, and places like that at some point, but maybe since I grew up in Canada, maybe they were just too close to home and I preferred, you know, living in South America to, uh, you know, now. But I'd, I'd love, to, love to study them at some point. Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, there there is some talk about the them containing giants, as you may know. And uh, and I recently had on uh, Illuminati contactee, I guess you might call him that, uh, or someone who was deep inside the Illuminati for a time, growing up. Uh, called The Ruiner, and a number of people, I think, have seen that interview, but he uh, talks about waking the giants and that he, he's been involved in that, uh, going inside the mounds and actually doing that. Um, have you got any thoughts about that? Any, uh, have you heard anything about the, the, the giants or, or seen their skele skeletons for that matter? But well, you know, the now when I say giants, I'm talking taller than the normal Anunnaki, you know, long hit. Yeah, well, um, you know, unfortunately, the Smithsonian and other institutions have um, done a very effective job at um, destroying or hiding um, a lot of the um, skulls and skeletons of, of these ancient people. I think. It, you know, it wouldn't surprise me whatsoever that other, you know, races of people have been living in the Americas other than simply, um, you know, native people who crossed the Bering Land Bridge. Um, when the native 
bands of people moved across the Great Land Bridge at the end of the last ice age or that time period, they may very well have, have um, discovered that there were people living there before. And um, I have no problem whatsoever that there could have been red-haired, very tall people living in the Americas that were eventually um, possibly exterminated or integrated into Native American cultures. Um, and that this sort of thing happened in other parts of the world as well, where you had probably smaller populations of um, subspecies of, of humans or others that interacted with and then were you know, wiped out by uh, what became the dominant race. The Homo sapiens sapiens, which is what we are, are the most destructive <laughs> life form on the planet. I, I'm sure we've been responsible for destroying many different fascinating uh, types of people that once lived here. Okay, well I have a little different point of view on that. I have to say that I think some of these people that came uh, were instrumental in, in making sure that humans did behave in a certain way. Uh, but at any rate, I, I'm wondering if um, if you have seen any what you would consider to be giant skeletons, skeletons of giants, like the way they do were described even in the Bible type of thing, um, where they would be huge. I mean, I'm I'm I have heard that there have been beings such as like that were 24 feet tall type of thing, you know, like a very very tall. Being. Yeah, unfortunately, I haven't seen one bone uh, that, that is that um, of that scale. Okay, just curious. Uh, there, I was in England and went to this. Uh, it's called, I think it's called something like the Museum of Surgery or something, and it's in the middle of London. And there is a very tall being there, a skeleton of a very tall being. Now, of course, they're saying it was some freak accident that caused, and it's really an Anunnaki being for all intents and purposes. But uh, actually, if you look at this, I, you know, I'm not, I know I'm not an archaeologist or whatever, and I'm not a scientist in that sense, but when you look at the proportions of this, of this skeleton, and it's, it's there on display for everyone to see, and it's hmm. clearly at least 9 feet tall, maybe 12 feet tall, um, it's it's proportional, you know, like so there there wasn't some weird anomalous thing, disease or something that, you know, made certain portions of the being un, uneven, you know, the growth was even in other words. So, have you ever gone to that museum? Are you aware of it? No, I'm fascinated. I'll have to I'll be going to England next April and I'll see if I can if I can find it. Yeah, it it would be great. I can I can find you know out where it is for you if you want to contact me on that. I'd love to have sure. someone else go look at that skeleton because uh, it's just there, there in plain sight, and I think it's it's just wild that they put it in in a place like that, and then they just say, oh, this was you know like I don't know they call it giantism or some some you know yeah. coining a term in essence to get away with uh, with depicting uh, what is in essence an Anunnaki what I consider to be an Anunnaki skeleton, so <laughs> in plain sight. Um, hmm. Yeah, I, when I was in Egypt, I also saw photographs in some of the museums there of, again, very large beings, not sure how tall because they were, you know, the knees were bent and that kind of thing. I don't know if you've gone to all the, the museums. There's one in, um, gosh, what's it called, um, the place where the, where the boats are. Um, oh God. Okay, well I can't remember the name of the area, but at any rate, it's a very small museum, but it has these photographs of, in essence, giants or or tall Anunnaki skeletons that have been unearthed, and they're the real photographs on the wall, with no explanation really. Have you wow. seen? No. <laughs> oh. <laughs> okay. Very interesting. Close to. Um, Nubia, that the, there is a border with Nubia and Aswan. That's it's oh, and Aswan. Oh, okay. Uh, there's a museum there. And oh, the Nubian museum. museum. It's a very old museum. It's kind of small and. Oh, anyway. really? Okay. Yeah. So, uh, it just just wondered if you'd seen that. Um, 
it's on the, you know, they do get these photographs do end up on the internet somehow, but to see the actual photograph, to, you know, in person is quite stunning. Yeah, and especially in a national museum or a government museum because they wouldn't, you know, they wouldn't be using Photoshop. There, there are also, of course, the um, sarcophagi inside the Cairo Museum that are nine feet tall and why would they make a sarcophagus that big if there wasn't a body of the same size inside of it? Yes, and I've always, I've always thought that was super obvious. <laughs> and yeah. yeah, this just, I mean, it's amazing all of this stuff. Well, uh, I probably could keep you here all night just asking you question after question, but um, I, I am sure you're getting a bit exhausted by all of it. I'm going to see if there's any last-minute questions here in the chat that I haven't covered. Um, is there any evidence of geopolymers as Joseph uh, Devadatus has discovered at Giza? Not familiar with that person. Uh, Joseph Davidowitz, no. Actually, geologists such as Robert Jock and others have, have stated emphatically that the stone, that uh, the limestone that makes up the Great Pyramid is from, you know, is, is natural stone that was cut out. There, there were no geo, geo, uh, geopolymers utilized as in making some kind of cement out of limestone and pouring it. And uh, the other obvious thing about that is that every one of the 2,300,000 2, stones that make up the Great Pyramid, each one is a different shape and size. So that means that every stone would have to have a different form or mold to be poured, to have the liquid poured into, which doesn't make any sense whatsoever. So that's their stand geologically um, from it. And I find it far more mysterious that each stone is a different shape and size and somehow somebody was able to cut all of these things, you know, from the bedrock and assemble something 500 feet tall. Uh, it's, yeah. you know, that, that thing is mind-boggling. Just incredible stuff. Uh, okay, uh, one, just one more question. Have you looked into the work of Joseph Farrell and uh, his talk about uh, the Great Pyramid being used as something of a of a weapon, there being some weaponization uh, uses, certainly involving the free energy aspects of it. But have you ever looked into any of that? Yeah, I've actually I've, I've listened. I've been in communication with him, and I've I've uh, listened to and watched um, interviews with him. Um, I don't have the same take on it. I think the the Great Pyramid um, were energetic structures. Um, uh, and that ties in with the tunnel system that runs underneath. It seems that water running underneath the Giza Plateau um, set up a special energy vibration and that the, the Great Pyramid was, an, was a, an energy transmitter of some kind. Uh, but I don't think it was used as, as a weapon. Okay. Have you been to Malta? Not yet. You and I are supposed to go. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know. Uh, and I'm, I'm so looking forward to when that happens, and I really want to make this happen. Uh, if I can this year, there's a number of places I'd like to go, but uh, there's always financing and getting yeah. people that, you know, people, I don't know what you're count, encountering, but people are kind of short of money and uh, trying to get them to come on a trip and, and make it all possible because without, you know, bringing the people, we can't really do the trip. So uh, it's, it's always that kind of you know, balancing act and then getting the speakers to all get there on the same day and time and want to and wanna show up. Everyone's so busy. Um, Michael Tellinger, uh, I'm sure you, you know him. You, you probably were maybe touring together in, in Australia, New Zealand. Yeah. Um, have you been to Adam's Calendar? Yeah, I have. Okay. And 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 did you go? Did you sort of experience it as a as a, as a time travel device at all? Did you have a sense of that, or did you have any thoughts about that particular site? Um, I, I find Adam's calendar quite strange. Um, it's you know, it's anomalous in the area. Um, some of the stones definitely seem to be aligned to the solstices and equinoxes. Um, it's a it's a very it's an interesting place. 
Um, I don't really understand it that well, and I'm not I'm not as I'm not as fascinated with it as um, as Michael is. But um, it's definitely a place that if anyone is interested, they should physically go in and see it because. It's it's enigmatic. Absolutely. Well, I I think it's fascinating, and I did do a, a documentary about it, interviewing Michael, and going around the various stone circles, and including Adam's calendar. Um, I am always struck by what I feel are, in essence, sort of time machines, time travel devices, whatever you want to call it, interdimensional portals. In these places, uh, and I will say that Gobekli Tepe definitely has that feel about it. Um, and I would be fascinated to hear what your impression is when you go. So uh, it's been wonderful to have you on the show, and uh, and and I'm hoping we're going to even get you to do your own show on the network at some point, so that you can report constantly from your travels, and and we can all share in that. Um, so thank you very much. Is there anything you want to talk about, you know, your website, your latest book, uh, where people can find these things? Uh, sure. I, uh, it's best if people want to look uh, at my web website. I've got two, actually. Um, my main one is hiddenincatours.com, um, which has a lot of uh, videos and stuff. Uh, my web, uh, sorry, my YouTube channel has almost 800 videos now. And my webmaster is building a brand new site, interactive, which will have other researchers on it. Uh, and it's called uh, hiddenhumanhistory.com. Wonderful. Gr great to hear. Okay. Well, uh, thank you again for coming on the show, Brian. Um, it, it's been great. And, and thanks for all the good questions from the audience. And uh, let's, let's revisit this in the near future when you have some new travels to report on. Okay, my pleasure. Thank you very much. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Good night. In terms of meditating, do you do you actually uh, when you go to these various sites, do you sit and meditate uh, to to kind of get in tune with them? Well, I'm actually I I was born very psychic, so I, I don't I honestly don't think I have to get into a meditative state. It, it just automatically happens. Okay. Um, when I go to, I mean, I think that was probably the initial attraction. Um, from childhood, it, just looking at them in pictures, and you, you know there's something that doesn't fit in terms of what we're being told about history, and then being able to interact with the site bus, um, and also the classic elongated skulls of Paracas, which which I believe are natural. I think, I think the oldest ones were born that way. They have this protrusion on the forehead, and that is related to the motor center, and, and possibly higher psychic uh, capability. Um, so that's why I, I just continue to study these ancient people because I can't get answers out of archaeologists. Absolutely. It's, um, it's just endlessly fascinating, really, to go down this line of inquiry. Uh, just themselves. Um, you pick, yeah. You definitely pick up certain things, not necessarily at the time, but afterwards, and your energy level definitely alters. Um, I get very um, energetically uplifted when I'm at these places, and it, it takes a while afterwards 
for me to wind back down. It's like suddenly having 10 cups of coffee because these places, um, you, you do naturally um, interact with them. And I think that was their original function anyway, was um, places of very, you know, very powerful, mind-altering energy. Yeah, I, I as, um, you know, have you gone into the thing where, you know, it has a larger frontal lobe or it has a bit larger, you know what I'm saying, um, that gives the being who has such a brain, like, different powers than the ones like us that are shaped a certain way? Yeah, well, it's a good question. We found some of the skulls have 25% greater uh, cranial capacity than a uh, normal human being, ancient person who lived in the area. Also, the shape of the skull means that the contact between the left and right hemispheres would be different from a Someone kind of is asking questions more than a com like a comment, but it, it implies a question, uh, saying that the elongated human brain, you're calling it human, I'm not sure it's human, but a uh, brain would uh, indicate some kind of possible benefit. I, I guess what they're kind of pointing at was that's, I'm assuming that's a larger brain. It perhaps has.